Welcome everybody to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. You know, a lot of times, and this is not really planned, is it, Jared? It's just kind of funny how the two of us work together. You lead us in, right? I know. Right? And so today I'm letting you relax. I'm leading in because you are in the hot seat, my friend. I'm just going <laughs> to pop up my feet. I love it. Take a cocktail. Well, don't drink before we start talk asking you questions because, you know, this okay. is serious stuff. Today we're doing a master class and we're calling it Funding at a Glance. This is a really interesting thing that Jarrett talks about, she lectures about, she works with clients on. And I'm really thrilled to get her um, intelligence and grace with us today. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. And today our guest in my co-host, the brilliant mind, Jared R. Ransom, nonprofit nerd and CEO of the Raven Group. We would not be here, Jared and I, if we didn't have these amazing partners, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, fundraising academy at National University, staffing boutique, nonprofit nerd, the nonprofit nerd herself, and nonprofit tech talk. You can find nearly a thousand episodes of the nonprofit show on streaming can broadcast. Can you believe that? Julia? No, I can't. A when thousand. I say it, I'm like, what? Podcast and then lot. our app. It's a lot, a lot of information. And you know, in, in nearly 1,000 episodes, you know, we get to hear from the two of us rarely in this context as a master class. And so this is really a nice thing for us for me personally, because we don't often just get to talk with one another for this yeah. entire time. So um, Jared R. Ransom, nonprofit nerd, CEO of the Raven Group. I personally think yeah. she's like one of the great minds of the nonprofit sector um, across this nation. And so to get her to work with me every day in this capacity is remarkable. We are very different. We have a 20 year time span um, of difference. And yet we are very similar. Don't you think, Jared? It's kind of a funky thing. Very different, but yet very passion. Different. Yeah, our passion is similar. Yeah. Our commitment is similar. Yeah. Uh, the way we might go about certain solutions might be slightly so different. Oh, I still yeah. think they're they're on a parallel track, but it might be, you know, kind of just right next door to the other. Uh, so it's really fascinating. And I think that's really a testament, truly, Julia, to so many amazing leaders that have served in our sector of all different generations for, you know, every single day. So yeah, uh, it takes all of us. It really does take all of us to, to pour our hearts into mm -hmm. this uh, sector. You know, and I love the way you phrase that because one of the things that we talk a lot about is diversity of thought, action, indeed. And so, you know, to everybody rowing in the same direction, but they need to be using different tools. They can't all have the same oars in many ways, right? And so that's what I love about this. Um, and it's really cool to, to be a part of you. The only thing I don't like is that in recently in this last year, we've started to dress alike. We started to show up with the same <laughs> colors. Well, you know, when you start spending so much time with someone, that's what happens. Apparently that also happens for animals and their dogs. So I don't think that we're quite at that level, but oh we're, we're doing a great job. Well, yeah. yeah, that's like when I have to like retire for permanently. Okay. Now you are a fundraising guru. You work with a lot of organizations, you coach organizations and individuals and you know, this is like the end of the year where I feel, Jared, a lot of folks are like, holy crap, we had a goal. Are we going to make it? Yes. You know, they don't know until like the end of the year or the quarter, maybe if they're lucky, um, if they're super right. lucky, the month. And so I think what you're here to talk to us about is understanding where we are at any point in time and how that can help us navigate where we need to be, where we want to be. And you start off by talking to us about figuring out what it is we need to know. So it's not yeah. as simple as just saying you met your goal or you didn't. Is that where you're going with this? 
There's so many data points on this. And I love that our guest yesterday, Crystal Cherry, mentioned, you know, board members are allergic to fundraising. And I just thought that was so funny. And she's right. A lot of people are allergic to fundraising. And so when it comes to what we need to know when it you know, for our revenue goals, there's so many pieces that come, come together. So here we're going to talk about your CRM data. So that's your donor database, your year over year data. And what is all of the data we're pulling to build a plan that we can continue to work? Julia, I just had this conversation ironically with Bloomerang, they asked me to come on and do a, a um, hour long webinar. So I did that. You can, you can find that webinar online. So this is kind of scratching the surface to that full hour. But then also I talked to an organization here in our community, Julia, that in the fourth quarter is transitioning their donor database. And they were a little worried about should this be the time that we do this. Mm -hmm. And so I shared again, a lot of what I'm sharing today with our viewers and listeners with them on, okay, here's how you can more or less safeguard your data from a previous CRM so that you can mm -hmm. capture that to move it to a new CRM. You mm -hmm. can cross-reference reports and uh, mm -hmm. you know data to make sure that it is pulling accurately. So mm -hmm. yes, first of all, is really get to know your CRM. And we often still have people ask, what is a CRM? So mm -hmm. it's your customer or your client relationship management database, mm -hmm. also referred to as a donor database. Thank you to Bloomerang. They're a fantastic donor database, one that I actually have my hands in quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm able to really reference these talking points into that uh, system, but there's so many other systems that you can look at. Um, knowing your year over year, like where are you this year as opposed to last year, the previous year. And then what I'm really coaching on too, Julia, is because of the pandemic, you know, we used to only go back three years. I'm recommending you go back five years now, yeah. like truly yeah. go back five years in this year mm -hmm. over year data point to see, are we meeting the mark? Are we missing the mark? Why, why are we, you know, like what's working, what's not working. And then also really using the data to build that picture, to build your plan, because that data, and we've talked about this in all of our episodes, right? Mm -hmm. Data is sexy, but you have to know the data. And if you're an organization, like the one I just referenced, that is moving your data from one system to the other, you might be really worried about your data integrity and is it accurate? Are you going to have that historical data that you've previously, you know, had to lean on? So there's a lot to think about, Julia, when it comes to funding at a glance. And it's not just your year end goal. It really is like you have to keep your finger on the pulse throughout every single month. Right. So let me uh, let's go back to that data, because one of the things I find so interesting is that, you know, with the pandemics and you and I agree on this very early that, you know, yeah, we had the global health pa pandemic, you know, COVID, mm -hmm. but we also had civil unrest epidemic, an epidemic that really in involved wellness and mental health in, in, in our societies. We had an economic crisis, really, that became, you know, something that just really shifted. So a lot of inputs, and now we have these these data points that are going to look quite a bit different as we navigate right. forward. So how do we temper that with, you know, just an asterisk that says, yeah, this was a kooky year, but it's really been a kooky three years? I mean... How do we look yeah. at that and still understand that the data points are are part of where we where we've been and where we need to go? I absolutely think you're you're on to what I coach, right? And it really is around making note of what was that monumental moment that took place. Um, the pandemic, a lot of funds were taken from arts and culture, and I shouldn't say taken, but really shifted <laughs> truly right. to the human service, right? Like basic food, clothing, shelter, yeah. and, you know, the extra curricular items that we might think of like arts and culture, mm -hmm. although still very critical in our society, 
you know, where we really shifted those funds into higher need segments of our nonprofit to, to help people survive day to day. So making a note of that, the other note we have coming up, Julia, is a presidential campaign. Yes. So go back to yes. the last presidential campaign, the one before that. How did that affect either positively or negatively your fundraising? What shifted those moments of of call to action, right? Yeah. Like what, what was happening in that time? Make yeah. a note of that. I always say, you know, like definitely put it in your database, but this is something that I think also should be shared with your board, because if your board's not understanding the ebbs and flow, you know, not just quarter to quarter or year over year, but we're talking four years over four years, you know, yeah. there's a lot of different metrics yeah. that play a part into how well we're doing. Right. Well, and think about how our service levels have changed because of the pandemics, um, because of a changing society, because of the digital nature of our society. Um, so we're, we're in a period of transition unlike no other. And so to understand this information, I've got to believe is even more important. And so I want to go to the next level of data points that you talk about. And, you know, early on um, the nonprofit show, man, I'm telling you, like, first couple months, you taught us the Libunt and Cybunt. Um, so re refresh our memories on this, and then let's keep going through some of these data points that, that we need to be looking at all the time, not just the end of the year, is what I'm hearing you say. Yeah. And when I first mm. learned early in my career, 20 plus years ago, I button I had no idea what that stood for. Right. It was acronym soup. I had, I had no clue. So last year, but unfortunately not this, and then some year, but unfortunately not this, the beauty of, of these two reports, they are often built in as a template into your CRM. So it truly is often like the click of a button, maybe a couple of buttons to pull this data but this is something that, you know, you definitely want to go to something else we've talked about, Julia, over, you know, our almost thousand episodes is the tenure of a development professional within yes. an organization. Also, why this data is critical is because if you are new to an organization, these are some data points that I recommend you pull within your first week, two weeks on the job, right? Mm -hmm. Also, if you're moving to a new uh CRM, pull these again from your new CRM. So there's a lot shifting, yeah. but that lie button and side button, those are my two go-tos, like really my, my go-tos all the time. You also really want to be familiar with that donor retention rate. And we've talked about this with yeah. various guests on our show. Mm -hmm. Sadly, that is decreasing. The rate that we are retaining donors keeps going down. This is mm -hmm. not good news, right? Like Again, if we were to run a restaurant or any other business, the way we run our donor retention rates, we would not stay in business. So that's something we need to take a look at. Major gifts, uh, that amount, Julia, changes for every organization. I've heard from organizations, their major gift level has been identified at $1,000, right. whereas other organizations are upwards of $25,000. Right. So the way you define a major gift for your organization is different, but here's the cool thing that can shift, right? You can start at a thousand, move it to 2,500, take it to 5,000, like really stair step it as your evolution of, of maturity of an organization or maturity of fundraising, but mm -hmm. you need to know what is our major gift. And I have to tell you, Julia, I presented to a board of directors, uh, Similar to this kind of conversation, I turned to the executive director and I said, what is your major gift level? They did not know it. Like they could just, not rattle it off the top of their head. Yeah. yeah. I was just going to ask you that. Like how many organizations have really stopped taking a deep breath and figured out what this number is? Because it's somewhat of an arbitrary number, right? I mean, you don't just look at your average. Um, don't you, isn't it more, I think, a little bit more wise to sit down and say, this is what we want to be a major right. gift. 
Do you, do you think that, or should it just be a statistical point in time? I do. So, so if no one, like if they haven't identified their major gift Mm -hmm. level yet, I do say, then let's pull your active donors. What is the going donation that you're getting consistently, right? right? What is that average gift amount? Mm -hmm. Uh, What is a significant dollar amount that would really be, you know, moving it from transactional to transformational? What would that dollar amount do? And maybe it is 25,000, right? But do you have the current donor activity now that warrants 25,000? Maybe not. So how do, where do we start and how do we move the needle to where it needs to be? So there's a couple of ways you can identify your major gift amount. But again, I really like to, you know, remind everyone you can change it and you can change it strategically, uh, you know, to, to really let that evolve as your fundraising practices evolve. Because as we started off kind of joking with our guest uh, from yesterday, Crystal Cherry, she said, board members are allergic to fundraising, right? So once they become immune to this allergy, Mm -hmm, (laughs) you might mm -hmm. actually see your fundraising dollars go up. Yeah. I love that. You know, I, I think it's such an important discussion to have because it really sets you on the track of understanding, um, where you want relationships to go and how they will go. Um, And it just moves you forward, I think, to another level of thinking. One of the last data points I want to talk to you about is direct mail. Um, And we've been having guests recently on different, different parts of our sector in the nonprofit world really champion direct mail and say, hey, look, you know, yeah, we're living in the digital age, but we're still doing great things with our direct mail. Um, and so could you talk to us about that a little bit, tracking those things? Yeah, I'm still a fan of direct mail. Uh, also, you know, one of the things I like to mention when it comes to this, Julia, is we are all inundated digitally, right? There is so much noise. There's a lot of digital inundation constantly. (laughs) But what we're starting to get less and less of is snail mail, right? We are starting to get less and less of snail mail. Mm -hmm. Now, except for your uh, presidential campaign time, that's when your your mail actually increases. You get a lot of postcards. Mm -hmm. uh, You get a lot of mail during that time that's around the political campaign. But I'm still a huge fan of direct mail. And I think if you do it strategically, it will warrant a nice ROI. Now, if you're looking to uh, really, you know, raise money from your existing donor base, that's where you're going to see your best ROI. If you're looking to make your direct mail an acquisition campaign, you're looking to gain new um, supporters, you're going to see a lower ROI. But the acquisition campaign of a direct mail appeal is the long game, right? Three, four, five years mailing to those same people to acquire their support. But if we're talking, Julia, sending direct mail to your existing donor database, there's some organizations that will send simply one a year. Right. There's others that send quarterly. Mm -hmm. Now there's some that in the fourth quarter, they will send four, (laughs) you know? So Mm -hmm. it really just depends on your organization, Mm -hmm. but you have to know your data. You have to track what comes back uh, from the mail on this, both digitally, because you point them to online donations, as well as remitting a check in the envelope that you've enclosed. So there's a lot going on with direct mail. Some people absolutely love it, and it's a point of their strategy. Other people have let it go by the wayside or only use it sparingly in like a once a year. You know, I think that... um right now man and and knowing that we were going to chat jared um i've really been attuned and i'm always attuned to this because i think just it's you know what we we do but i'm really attuned to the the number of uh mail pieces that are coming in now we we work and we interview 300 people a year obviously so i mean a lot of those people that we interview automatically put us in their their system and you know we get, I get a lot of mail. Um, but what I am always excited by is like, I would call it kooky mail, like Mother's Day, you know, yeah. sending something for Mother's Day or for Easter, 
or a spring kickoff or Valentine's Day, things that aren't just the normal direct mail, like everybody squeezing in, starting, you know, promotions around Thanksgiving and then Christmas or Hanukkah. I mean, you know, that's where it just is, is so busy. But looking at something that's different, that Absolutely. literally sticks out of the mailbox, you know, and you're like, wow, okay. Um, because it yeah. also seems to me that donors have to parse out what they're going to give, you know, during the Q4 and the holidays are, okay, I'm going to give, you know, a little bit here, here and there. But how many yeah. solicitations do you get for Mother's Day? Right. Probably well, it, it depends, right? And I always say for that, it's dependent on your mission. So if you are an organization right. that course. has an awareness month, you might want to increase yeah. your communications, including your direct mail during that month. The other thing I really like to do, and it's not quite direct mail, but it's probably a cousin of direct mail, is anniversary letters. So mm -hmm. sending out an anniversary card to your supporters mm -hmm. in that origin month that they started giving to your organization. It's similar to a birthday card, but often, sadly, we don't know the birth dates of our donors. Mm -hmm. That seems to still be a really hard piece of data collection. Okay. So if your donor database is solid and you feel really good about that data, you can do something similar of a direct mail campaign, but mm -hmm. do it as an anniversary card to mm -hmm. your supporter. And I love and that. Well, those you can do monthly, right? So it's yeah. not you're sending out to everyone at one mm -hmm. time. You're going month by month by month. So mm -hmm. it's a smaller project. Well, and I think it's really, um, it's a wonderful connecting piece. Because I think a lot of times we give and we, we we just forget or, you know, to talk about that journey that the organization has been on. Um, and, and what your impact has been over the years is super powerful. Because again, as you know, as a donor, a lot of times we give and we don't really know what's going to happen or we don't really know what's, what's being navigated. But to share this and be a part of that, I think it's also healthy for the organization because I realize that this would be somewhat of a pro forma piece that wouldn't change that much. But I think it forces the organization to say, okay, what is it that we've achieved? Where have we yeah. moved the needle? What are we doing? As opposed to just wrapping it all up for the, you know, for the year end report. I think it's, I think it's a healthy thing on both sides, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's a great touch point. And again, like it really works for organizations that are confident in their data, right? If you did a migration and you're like, sure if this person started to give in 2012 or 2019 like might not be the best best strategy for you to employ but again you have to know your data well knowing the data and, and understanding how we're going to use it um let's kind of finish up our chat with the concept of the dashboard and and i'm going to ask you to physically hold up the the yeah. report that you use and the dashboard um, because funding at a glance i mean is a great concept and it's a really great tool but it's a physical thing as well and so you created something years ago and you've massaged it and yeah. and we can get this from you by going to your website yeah. Yeah, so this is just a, a printed copy of it where it has all of these various data points year over year over year. You'll see this one is showing simply three years, but you can uh, pull that out five years. You can even make it electronically. So yes, I uh, sharing is caring. So uh, if you want this document, let me know. Happy to send that to you. Also shared it uh, with the Bloomerang webinar that I recently did. But this also goes with your digital dashboard in many places, right? So that donor retention is often in your digital dashboard of your CRM um, year over year. That's something too, that if you're working in a robust uh, CRM platform, you do see that year over year data point. So this is just a really good 
opportunity to collect the data in one place. I then go on to say, take a look at this uh, to see what's working, what's not working, where do we need to note any kind of a historical moments that mm -hmm. might have shifted either up or down our fundraising. Okay. This is such a good tool to help set that plan. Um, and I always say it can get overwhelming, but if you set three goals, right, like from this, from this plan, you say, okay, Here's where we need to focus our energy and effort. You know, this section isn't looking too hot. We want to increase that. Then select three areas that you want to, you know, see an increase for next year or next quarter. Create a plan around that, right? Because you have to know what you're working with. And again, the tenure of our uh, development professionals, right? If we're talking 18, 18 months, months for a development director to hold their position, Having this data for the next development director is critical because it really, it, it holds the mission of the nonprofit in integrity, right? And we're right. here for the mission. We're not here for our personal gain. We're mm -hmm. here to support the mission. So what can we do to leave the organization in a great place? And I really think this is a, a tool that will help to do that. It's also a great tool, shockingly, that the board members love because guess what? There's charts and graphs and numbers and there's tangible things that your board members can really sink their teeth into. Right, because I think all too often, this is like a year end um, issue that we might not even get this information until February or March, depending right. on when the year end when closes. You close the books. And you yeah, close yeah. the books and then it's like punitive. It's either like kiss or cry. You got it. Woohoo, yay team. Or you didn't. Yeah. And nobody understands the why. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, you know, a generative issue of why we have such abysmal retention rates, not only for our donors, but for our teams and the development director. Right. I mean, that stat comes from AFP. That's a real number that's being tracked. It's not just an yeah. imaginary thing. So this is a shocking part um, of one of our, our systematic failures within our sector, don't you think? You know that I do. Yeah. And for maybe them. others that don't know AFP, Association <clears throat> of Fundraising Professionals. So that's really, you know, uh, the go to organization international that really helps to set some of these standards. They do some phenomenal research. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you're right. AFP, Association of Fundraising Professionals, you know, has shared the scary, sobering scary. data, right? That mm -hmm. nonprofit fundraisers are not staying. Mm -hmm long that 18 month tenure is really what we're seeing and it's not just a pandemic issue i mean this has been no, enough that, that they've been tracking for a while so yeah, yeah it's really several really, years yeah a couple of years well you know of course jared i love being able to chat with you and learn from you as as our viewers um know you and and get to hear from you uh, but this is really magical being able to get a master class getting this information from you to understand um, how we can be less frustrated and more on target and understanding how we make decisions, where we can Im uh, affect, impact, and really understand how we're moving forward as opposed to just, well, we missed it this year or nobody loves right. us. I mean, being right. a lot more intelligent and strategic is what this is all about. Jared R. Ransom, the nonprofit nerd, CEO of the Raven Group, um, check out the ravengroup.com, T H E R A Y V A N G R O U P.com. And you can see a lot of these tools that Jarrett um, has, has come up with through her, her uh, wonderful career. And um, I always like to say, amazing nerd brain. So, um, <laughs> well, well, thank you. It's fine. There's not many people. I know, I know a few, but there's not many people that will raise their hand and say, I absolutely love to ask for money. Right. But I'm one of those people. I absolutely love to ask for money. Yeah. I love to take the fear out of fundraising. I love for us to create educational moments and information to move forward because that's, what's going to make it a success. Exactly. And you know, it's, it's, um, it's hard, but in many ways, it's not that hard when you have a plan and you have a process and you have measurement, right? right. And I think that's, yeah. I think that's what, where you and I are on the same page and that 
we, we really, you know, um, try and promote that. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Been joined by Jared R. Ransom. She's been in the hot seat. So she has been like co-host, hot seat, a little bit of everything today. Again, <laughs> we are so grateful for the support of our partners and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. Again, these are the folks that have been with us uh, for more than 900 episodes, now marching towards 1,000. And uh, what a journey it has been, my friend. As we start to wrap up 2023, I love your message today because now is the time to be looking at this stuff, not at the end of the year. That's right. Well, yeah. Always. I think it's it's a great tool that you can take a look at every quarter, every month, and really just keep your finger on the pulse. Thank I you. I love it. Fundraising at a glance. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us um, on another episode of The Nonprofit Show. As we like to end every episode, we want to remind you to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow, everyone.